It's no secret that I primarily focus on retro handhelds on this channel, and one of the most frequent comments that I get is usually some combination of, that's fine, but why not just use a phone with a Bluetooth controller? Well, today we're going to do just that. Hello everyone, my name is Taki, and today we're going to take a look at turning your old phone into an emulation powerhouse. This is actually a video that I'd planned on doing back in November, but I put it off to work on other projects. I also changed my original plan of using a few old phones to something more modern after I saw how my old Xiaomi was able to run Citra in a video that I did a while ago. Just for comparison, this i7s is currently the best we have when it comes to a gaming device with built-in controls, and it has a sizable lead from the next best device on the market. What I want to see today is how close we can get to replicating this performance with a lower end Snapdragon and a variety of Bluetooth controllers at various price points. The first thing that you're going to need to deal with is picking the quote unquote right Bluetooth controller. These are the controllers that I use for product testing and for my own personal use. You can see that there are essentially two different styles of controllers on the market and the one that's the best for you will have a lot to do with how you intend on using it. If budget allows, I would advise getting one of both of these styles so you can get full coverage, but even if you were to pick a standard controller with a phone clip, you can't really go wrong as long as the device has proper input support. Doing in-depth coverage on these controllers is really outside the scope of this video, but I will try to share some useful information as the video progresses. The key points are that there are a ton of controllers on the market and not all of them are good, but more importantly, not all of them are worth trusting with your primary phone, which is something that I've never seen mentioned here on YouTube. The purpose of this video is to recycle a device that you already own, and while I would never advise someone to go out and buy a prepaid phone or something like that, you can pick up phones like this for under $100 on used markets if you don't have something decent lying around. The Xiaomi Redmi Note 5 Pro comes with a Snapdragon 636 CPU, an Adreno 509 GPU, 4GB of RAM, 64GB of storage, a 4000 mAh battery, and a 5.99 inch 1080 by 2160 display. I want to preface this video by saying that I've never used this device for emulation in the two years that I've owned it. I used this device extensively when I was known for sushi instead of noodles, so I do know that it's decent, but I have no idea of how it will hold up to the i7s or other devices on the market. My only real goal for this project is to get a few retro systems set up like Super Nintendo, N64, PlayStation 1, DS, and maybe some more modern ones like GameCube, Wii, and PlayStation 2. I've gone ahead and installed all of the software that I need for the controllers that I'll be using in this video, along with some universal apps that can accomplish the same thing, like Octopus. Outside of this, we have our Android games, and we also have some useful apps like Screen Info and Geekbench. I've gone ahead and tested this device so you can compare it with your own at home. This 636 has a single core score of 1335 and a multi-core score of 4900. The most important thing when picking a phone that you will convert into a gaming system like I will in this video is making sure that the phone actually has a properly configured refresh rate. This will not be an issue on Snapdragon devices, but there are a lot of MTK phones on the market that do not have refresh rates near or at 60 hertz, and it will totally ruin your enjoyment when you go to play 60 FPS games and you encounter visible screen tearing. So I will just say that you need to be aware of this fact. The next big decision that you need to make is deciding how you will present your games. There are a lot of different front ends like Dig and Arc Browser, but there are also completely different launchers that you can use to make your phone look more like a console, like the ATV launcher. For the purposes of this video, I'll be using Dig with a Wii theme that I downloaded because I think it looks really polished and I like the nostalgia of it. I haven't gone through and downloaded all the artwork yet, but you can see that there are a lot of icons for the systems that it's already downloaded and a bunch of cover art for my N64 folder. We're going to start off our testing with RetroArch using the XMB menu theme. I've just gone ahead and configured a few of the default options. I've turned off threaded video and bilinear filtering, but I'm also going to enable integer scaling purely for personal preference. I've gone ahead and also downloaded all of the cores that I need to make this process pretty seamless, and it should take you only about two minutes to get to the point where I am right now. All of the ROMs that I'll be testing in this video are running off an internal 128GB SD card, but you don't really need a device that supports an SD card if you don't mind swapping your games out as you finish them. The first system that I'll showcase here is Super Nintendo, and you can obviously see that we have a ton of dead space on both sides, which is something to consider when you are thinking about doing something like this, especially if you're going to use a phone with a very large aspect ratio like the one I have here. I personally don't mind because the screen itself is really nice and the image is very crisp, but this is obviously not as ideal as using a device with a proper aspect ratio. 
I'm going to be moving over to the SN30 Pro Plus, which is one of the newer controllers that I've added to my collection. And I did so because the SN30 Pro really isn't comfortable to hold when you clip it to a phone as large as the one that I have here. The SN30 Pro can put a lot of strain on your hands, so this Super Nintendo and PlayStation 1 Fusion controller is really a huge upgrade over what is otherwise my favorite controller on the market. Let's move over to GBA, and you can see that we are able to fill out more of the phone screen with less dead space while maintaining a crystal clear image. It's not really surprising, but you can see that this processor has no problem at all with GBA. Now let's move over to PlayStation 1 with Crash Team Racing. I haven't mentioned this yet, but I've opted for HID input on all of the controllers that support the feature. This allows you to have standard input that will be recognized for apps like RetroArch, but it also allows you to ditch the controller software and use something like Octopus if you want to map screen controls to the handheld. Even though I could continue to use RA to run N64, I'm going to opt for using Moop N64 since I find it to be much better on Android devices in this performance range. Let's take a quick trip over to DS with Drastic. As you can see, the system doesn't completely fill out the full screen, but the larger aspect ratio does allow it to have a large main screen with a usable mini one on the top right that you can use for touch input if needed. I've already gone ahead and enabled all the visual improvement options in this app, and we're still able to hit that FPS cap with no issues. Because we have a GPU that supports OpenGL 3+, we can use the ReDream emulator for Dreamcast for the best performance and ease of use. For PlayStation Portable, I'm going to switch back over to using a horizontal controller because it just seems strange to play this system with a phone clip. You can see that I've already gone ahead and set this SciTake controller to HID input to make it easier to use. I have the PSP emulator set to Vulkan and the picture renderer is set to 3x with the FPS in the top right hand corner. Here's one of the most notorious PSP games running at 2x resolution. And here's Ratchet and Clank at 3x resolution with the buffered render option with no issues. Now let's move over to GameCube, and I want to say that I really didn't have any expectations that this system would run well on this chip until I saw 3DS running in my other video. I'm running this using the MMJ build from last year, so don't expect to get this level of performance with a lower end device using the official Dolphin build.
And just so you can see, this is Twilight Princess using the official Dolphin emulator with all of the best options enabled. And here it is again with the MMJ build. We do have some stuttering in Wind Waker that I could probably fix with a different version of the official emulator, but I didn't feel it was necessary with how well everything else ran. Now let's move over to some Android games, which really call for a different style of controller. I'm reminded of an MKBHD video where he talked about asking tech reviewers to pull out their phones that they actually use when they aren't promoting other devices, and they were almost all Apple. I'm sure you could probably find something like that in this market too, but this is actually the controller that I personally use the most. I use this with a device that I cannot wait for all of you to be able to see, and I haven't seen anything that matches the quality of this style yet. The only thing that I don't like about this controller is the fact that you need to grant it developer mode access with an RSA token via the USB port each time you want to use it. This is obviously a security issue, but if you don't intend on using this on a primary device with your personal details, it shouldn't be an issue. For PlayStation 2, you really only have two options at this point on Android. You can use Damien PS2, which really has abysmal performance for most games, or you could stream PS2 from your PC. I actually own the paid version of Damien PS2 and I know it's trash for this phone so I didn't even bother to test it and I opted instead to stream PS2 from my main PC at a higher resolution. My Wi-Fi signal is pretty shit in my studio, but this has absolutely no problems running well when I'm outside in other parts of my house. The real appeal to doing something like this is to be able to play PC games with a better screen resolution than the ones you can find on even the best Chinese handhelds that we currently have access to. I have to say that I'm pretty impressed with what I was able to get out of this old 636 phone that I had lying around. This would easily take the place as the second best handheld on the market if this chip was used in a handheld. I still think that a proper handheld can be a much better option when done correctly than the sum of its parts, but this is a viable solution if you want to enter the handheld gaming scene, but you don't have $300 to $700 lying around to dump on mobile gaming. So yes, you can use a phone with a Bluetooth controller to make a great handheld. And I did do that myself in this video, but I still think there are many cases where a dedicated handheld can be the superior option. If you like this video and you want to support my work, please consider leaving a like below and subscribe for future content. If there's something else in this area that you want to see me cover or anything else at all, feel free to leave a comment below and I'll try my best to make it happen. We are getting closer to being able to finally go out and enjoy the rest of our day, but until that time comes, happy gaming everyone. Talk you out.